Hi everyone, and welcome to our overview of Chapter 3, First Amendment Freedoms and Religion. As a review of any day's world news will tragically reveal, people around the globe are killing each other over religious differences. But how is it that in the U.S., the most religiously diverse nation on the planet, people holding every religious faith in the world still manage to live side by side in relative peaceful coexistence? The reason is our First Amendment and its religion clauses through which our founders established a reasonable separation between church and state, protecting the church and the individual from state interference in private religious choices, and protecting the common government from being disrupted and consumed by sectarian disputes and religious conflicts. As students of history, our founders understood that the core reason people of different religions fought was over who controlled the power of government, and with that power, the ability to prohibit and punish the teaching and practice of rival faiths, to coerce religious submission or conversion, and to indoctrinate the next generation of children into their religious beliefs through compulsory attendance in state-controlled schools. The power to coerce religious faith is the power to destroy religious faith, something true religious believers will not tolerate. Religious co coercion is a sure path to religious conflict. In sharp contrast to the religious fighting in much of the world, Mr. Jefferson's wall of separation has managed to keep us safe while also protecting essential religious liberties. But the wall of separation between church and state is not an absolute wall, and it was never intended to be. If a public school teacher is teaching a lesson on the pilgrims, for example, and a child asks the teacher, why did the pilgrims come to America? The teacher can certainly tell the students that they came for purposes of religious freedom. The U.S. Supreme Court has never required an absolute separation between church and state in public schools. To the contrary, in Abington v. Shemp, the court stated, It might well be said that one's education is not complete without a study of comparative religion or the history of religion and its relationship to the advancement of civilization. It certainly may be said that the Bible is worthy of study for its literary and historic qualities. Nothing we have said indicates that such study of the Bible or of religion, when presented objectively, as part of a secular program of education, may not be affected consistently with the First Amendment. What is required is a reasonable separation in which both individual religious beliefs and legitimate public interests are protected. This is achieved through the First Amendment's Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. The First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution declared, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The great challenge in understanding and applying the First Amendment's religion clauses is that because these clauses seek to achieve a proper balance and not an absolute separation, they cannot be understood in rigid absolute terms. There is instead an ever-evolving continuum created in which the law is clear in the extremes, but less clear as we approach the grayer areas in the center of this continuum. For example, at the establishment end of the church-state continuum, we know that requiring children to say prayers composed by state officials is unconstitutional and in violation of the Establishment Clause. At the other end of the continuum, we know that all citizens, including children, have free exercise rights to pray in schools and any place else, subject only to reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. The key to navigating the closer questions concerning church-state law is for government officials, while acting in their official capacities, to remain neutral concerning religion, and to make good faith efforts to respect all persons' varied religious beliefs and the lawful expression of those, those beliefs. Freedom of belief and expression are the most fundamental of all human rights. Humans are unique in their abilities to think abstract thoughts, formulate complex systems of belief, and communicate these ideals through speech, writing, and other means of expressive communication. To deny these rights of belief and expression to any persons is to deny their right to be fully human. <clears throat> Nonetheless, human history is in substantial part a long and tragic tale of powerful individuals, organizations, and governments attempting to deny freedom of belief and expression to those whose ideas might challenge the existing religious or political status quo. That is why protections for religious and political speech are at the core of the First Amendment. 
the founders fully understood that self-interested defenders of the status quo have always discouraged new beliefs in the communication of new ideas because they knew that ideas can change individuals. And when an idea becomes widely accepted, ideas can change the world. When the U.S. Declaration of Independence declared all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, and whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. Those were ideas with the power to change the world. New ideas change people, and people with new ideas change the world. King George and his government had good reason to fear these powerful ideas, but they were ultimately powerless to stop them. Individuals are vulnerable to coercion, imprisonment, or death, but no one can kill an idea. And the more powerful the idea, the harder it is to silence. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, you can kill the dreamer, but you can't kill the dream. The ideas that came from the pen in Thomas Jefferson's hand were far more dangerous to King George's rule than any sword. And the ideas that Dr. Martin Luther King communicated through his moving and powerful speeches changed the world. Ideals of human equality under the law, unalienable human rights, and government as a servant, not as a master, rapidly changed the worldviews of millions and ultimately improved the lives of billions of people. These ideas transform the world in a process of global democratization that still continues. American founders understood the human harm and social stagnation that resulted from a government that punished uh, free will in thought and free freedom of expression and belief. They knew that the printing press was the remedy for the dark ages. Free speech was the essential protector of all other freedoms and a free marketplace of ideas was the best guarantee of future prosperity, security, and better life for all. So they sought to free both the human mind and the human tongue and let individual people, rather than powerful and self-interested government officials, decide which ideas they wish, they wish to speak, hear, and accept as their own. They enshrined these principles into the U.S. Constitution, including broad protections for individual rights of belief and expression in the First Amendment. Protections for individual freedom of belief are at the core of the First Amendment and the core of human liberty. But it is the official establishment of religion that has historically posed the greatest danger to both the individual right to believe and the common peace. By definition, religious faith is rooted in individual belief and free will concerning that belief. As James Madison, the author of the First Amendment, recognized, Efforts to use the force of government to coerce and compel beliefs have caused great pains to individuals throughout history and served as the basis of countless conflicts and wars. In recognition of these concerns, the First Amendment's Establishment Clause prohibits government officials from establishing any favored or disfavored religion. The common government is to remain neutral concerning matters of religious faith, leaving these issues to individual citizens and to those they choose to turn to for religious guidance. The Free Exercise Clause mandates that government officials must respect individual free exercise of religion and provide reasonable accommodations, including exemptions from otherwise valid governmental requirements when necessary for the free exercise of sincerely held religious beliefs. In summary, the First Amendment's religious clauses have been interpreted as requiring official governmental neutrality concerning religion and establishing a reasonable wall of separation between church and state in order to protect both. It is important to emphasize, however, as I previously noted, that this wall of separation between church and state is not an absolute wall of separation. Religion has played a central role in, the, in countless people's lives, and it has been a driving force throughout much of human history. Religion cannot be banned from the public square without also banning the free expression of people who hold religious beliefs. On the other hand, history shows that few issues are more divisive than whose religion will be officially recognized and favored in the public square. The purpose of the symbolic wall of separation between church and state is to set, is to set appropriate boundaries between private religion and public uh, governmental powers. This protects religion from governmental interference. 
and protects the common government from the disruption and divisiveness of conflicts over whose religion should receive official endorsement and have the power to compel others to express belief or face governmental punishments. The height and strength of the wall of separation increases or decreases in each case depending on the degree of, degree of danger presented by the commingling of church and state. For example, the court has dismissed challenges to the use of the phrase in God we trust on coins, and so help me God in the presidential oath of office. This passive benign use of these phrases by government seems to present little real danger that anyone's religious freedom is truly jeopardized. Therefore, the wall of separation is low enough and flexible enough to allow for the continued lawful use of these religious terms by government. At the other end of the continuum, however, public school-sponsored prayer has been repeatedly rejected by the court as a genuine danger to individual religious freedom and, and the essential maintenance of religious neutrality by the common government. The wall of separation between church and state is at its highest in public schools where highly impressionable children are subject to compulsory attendance laws enforced through criminal sanctions. The, rea the reality is that it would be every extremist proselytizer's dream to have the power of government to separate other people's children from their families, and in this compelled isolation, to teach these vulnerable, impressionable children to reject their own family's religious beliefs and traditions, and to only respect and practice the proselytizer's beliefs. The court has recognized that captive audiences of highly impressionable children are vulnerable to state-sponsored religious indoctrination. Further, few issues are more potentially divisive and disruptive than battles over whether the political majority should have the authority to compel religious beliefs and practices on other people's children through compulsory school attendance. As a nation of immigrants, many of whom fled from religious persecution in Europe and other places, the U.S. is extremely religiously diverse, with thousands of variations of world faiths. Yet. Most Americans share common democratic values and a desire that children learn good character and citizenship. And most Americans also hold strong personal religious beliefs and family traditions. Many have suggested that public school prayer be used to teach good character and citizenship. But if children were to pray together in the common public school under the direction of school officials, whose prayer should they all pray? What common public school prayer could possibly be as religiously diverse as the people that would be asked to pray this prayer? What single prayer could capture the faiths of the many denominations of Protestants, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Native Americans, etc., and yet not be religiously objectionable to any of these faiths? And if you attempted to religiously water down the common prayer so that it was offensive to no one, wouldn't it become potentially offensive to all religious believers as a compromised, insincere governmental desecration of their genuine religious faith? In Chapter 3, we will address the Establishment Clause limitations on public schools, including school prayer, religious use of school facilities, teaching evolution and creationism, religious dis displays on school property, and state aid to religious schools. We will also look at free exercise of religion in public schools, including religious exemptions to school attendance laws, health and vaccination requirements, other school requirements and activities, release time for religious instruction, and the religious rights of school employees. Chapter 3 will also introduce us to our four first judicial tests. Over time, and based on extensive experience in wrestling with difficult legal issues, judges have developed legal tests to help guide them in the consistent application of the law. But these legal tests can also be used by school officials to assess the, the legality of their actions and policies, making a working knowledge of these legal tests in education law invaluable knowledge for all school officials. Chapter 3 will introduce you to the first legal tests used to measure compliance with the First Amendment's religion clauses, including the Lemon Test, and its alternative endorsement and coercion tests for gauging whether government actions violate the Establishment Clause, and the court's test for determining whether an individual is entitled to a reasonable accommodation under the Free Exercise Clause. In Chapters 3 and 4 on the First Amendment, 
you will find some of the Court's greatest opinions on questions of vital importance to us all. I think you will find your readings in these chapters most interesting and enlightening. I hope you will enjoy your readings and that you will find what you're learning highly useful for you personally and professionally. Very best wishes to all.